So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to this post-summit briefing and EPC update, our regular look at the key developments in and around the European Union. My name is Jackie Davis. I'm a senior advisor to the European Policy Centre. And with me this week, as always, Fabian Zulik, Chief Executive and Chief Economist of the EPC, and Deputy Chief Executive and Director of Studies, Yanis Emanoulidis. A very warm welcome to you both. In this special edition of Update, we're going to be discussing the outcome of the EU summit that took place in Brussels yesterday and today. It finished a short while ago. And the wider political landscape with major developments in key European countries and what they mean for the European Union. As always, a totally interactive discussion. I'll be asking Fabian and Yanis some questions, and then I will bring in any questions or comments from all of you. Click on the raised hands button if you want to speak, and I'll allow you to talk when the time comes, or put your question in the Q&A box, not the chat, the Q&A, and please be as brief as possible. So, um, Yanis, just set the scene for us, will you, in terms of what was on the agenda at this summit, and did anything actually happen? Well, obviously something happened. We have eight pages of council conclusions, so that in itself shows you that something was discussed and decided. Um, but they were having a very intense discussion yesterday um, on issues related to energy, um, which is something we're going to dwell into depth um, in this update. Um, they had a discussion today on um, EU-China, which I think is of a certain significance to have this kind of a strategic exchange. Um, and then a multiple um, list of other issues related, especially to external relations, obviously Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, uh, and how to deal um, with that in future. Um, and also a number of other issues related to, to Iran um, and other external relation issues. So there, there was um, a long list on the agenda, but as I said, they were actually concentrating very much on energy issues um, and then EU China today. Okay, let's talk about energy first. And, and um, Fabian, I must confess, I'm a little confused because uh, the summit went on last night, the discussions on energy until two o'clock in the morning. And everyone this morning was talking about an agreement. But as far as I can tell, they didn't seem to agree on anything except to agree to go on talking, to send it to energy ministers, not to actually kill off any of the proposals. Uh, I mean, what was any progress absolutely actually made? Ursula von der Leyen talked about having a very good and solid roadmap, giving us the strategic direction we wanted. But then Charles Michel was talking about a list of measures to be discussed. Um, clarify, will you? Where did we get to? Well, I think, um, firstly, it's important that there is an agreement, um, however you judge its content, um, but this was a very difficult discussion. Uh, we saw a lot of differences um, also already in the run up um, to the summit, uh, so that they have actually managed to come together, um, put something on paper, I think is, is firstly a positive step. Um, secondly, I think you do see that uh, they have agreed on a broad direction. Um, and that was also important um, because it wasn't clear whether all countries would uh, want to go into this direction together, uh, and particularly among some of the major countries, uh, there were some differences. Uh, so in that sense, it's a success. Um, but what is now missing is how do you translate that concretely into reality? Um, and for that, uh, there's now the task um, to come up with, as it says in the council conclusion, concrete decisions. Uh, so we are not at that stage yet. Um, and I'm sure there will also be further discussion. I think we also have um, the constructive vagueness, uh, which is uh, often a hallmark of finding a compromise in an area uh, where it's difficult to find uh, the compromise. Um, so there's still more to come, but it was a step forward. Um, what we still have to discuss is whether it is a sufficient step forward uh, also in the current environment and also with what is coming next. My expectation would be that they will have to do a lot more in the coming month, um, but uh, we are where we are at the moment. Mm. I like that phrase, constructive vagueness. Um, I'll come back to that in a moment. But just in terms of that list of measures that Charles Michel was talking about, Yanis, what's on it? 
And where are the biggest areas of disagreement? Well, first of all, this is a very typical EU compromise. And it's a very typical compromise, especially if you take into account the huge uh, amount of different positions, different interests, uh, which have been on the table and are still sitting around the table if you look into the EU 27. Some in favor of a gas uh, cap, price cap, and very much um, uh, arguing in that direction, others being very hesitant about it. And uh, we've been discussing this now for weeks and for summits. Uh, this is not the first summit dealing with the issue, obviously. Um, there are others who fear that we might have higher gas consumption um, and that that would really lead in the wrong direction. Some fearing um, that this might lead to the need for rationing, others fearing that this would be counterproductive from an environment climate perspective. So you see there's a huge amount of different positions. And I think what we now have on the table, Ursula von der Leyen described it as a roadmap. I would call it, I would define it as a compromise corridor, which now encompasses a whole list of different issues, which is reflecting these different interests and positions, which I just tried to lay out. Mm -hmm. So you have obviously one, this, uh, this uh, proposal or this agreement to have a temporary dynamic price corridor on national gas transactions. This is what had been discussed for a long time. Uh, Germany had very much uh, been uh, critical of this. And now Berlin is saying, okay, we agree on it. It shall be temporary. But again, the devil will lie in the detail. We have an agreement on a temporary framework to cap price of gas and electric electricity production. This is the Iberian model, uh, which some are advocating, not only uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese, but also the French president is one who is supportive of this idea. We have third, the idea of having a voluntary joint purchasing of gas, um, something like a buyer's cartel, uh, which is something which had been discussed. I remember the discussion happening in 2014 uh, when uh, Tusk was still prime minister of Poland saying, this is what we actually need. And at the time this was unthinkable. So now you've moved in that direction. That's something which is new. Um, then issues related to solidarity energy solidarity in case of uh, supply disruptions in the winter, uh, but also thinking of how to protect households and businesses, in particular the most vulnerable, also through EU means. Um, then you have uh, an agreement in this corridor, as I define it, um, to increase the effects to save energy without specifying what exactly that would mean. But still, you, this just shows you how much of a mesh this is trying to satisfy everyone uh, by including all these different elements into one package. But if you wouldn't have had this package, we would not be at the point now where at least we can discuss, okay, now it's up to energy ministers to sit down together. They will sit down on Tuesday. They have now the mandate at least knowing what they should have included in that corridor, what should not be included, but what should be included in the corridor. And I'm not sure that even the ministers will be able to work that out or whether we might require, as the German Chancellor said, another European Council. Come back on that in a yeah. moment. But uh, Fabian, uh, that compromise corridor, so we talked about constructive vagueness, we now have a compromise corridor, we're building up those glorious EU expressions by the minute. Um, would it, the elements that are in that corridor, would they be sufficient to go back to your own question of earlier uh, or are they really being not ambitious enough or I mean listening to Yanis and that huge shopping list of potential measures is part of the problem here trying to do all of them at once and do they need to break it down into to smaller chunks to get somewhere? Well, I think um, as with any kind of European compromise um, which has that uh, constructive vagueness in it. Um, if we were to design what we should be doing at the European level, it would look very different um, from an ideal point of view. But as Janis was saying, this is very much a political compromise. It's about uh, accepting all of the different elements uh, which everyone brought on the table without uh, rejecting anything which has been um, promoted by certain countries. Um, so uh, is it going to be enough? Um, I think the, the difficulty lies in uh, all of us not really knowing what is going to be needed, what is going to be enough, uh, how bad it's going to get. Uh, one of the big determinants of all of this is the weather. Um, we are very dependent on having hopefully a mild winter. Um, another determinant is how dynamic our economies are going to be. Um, are we going to see that uh, demand for energy um, is choked off by a lack of growth? Um, in any case, um, there are many uncertainties we're facing. But for me, I think the, the most glaring omission in all of this um, 
is a much more explicit solidarity mechanism. Um, not only talking about what happens um, in terms of supply bottlenecks, um, but talking about how do we help those countries which don't have the fiscal means, which don't have uh, the possibilities of some of the stronger countries to ensure that they can also demonstrate to populations that we are all sitting in the same boat and that we are not going to allow anyone to be cold and hungry this winter. Uh -huh. um, I think for me, that is uh, the most important element because it will have a very direct political impact if we don't manage to do that. Absolutely. And just going back to your point, Yanis, about will we need another summit? Uh, as you indicated, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz did imply uh, that or indeed all these proposals could be kicked into touch, that you'd have to start again. He used the phrase, if we don't get a deal, if energy ministers can't sort this out, we'll have to go back to the drawing board at a European Council. Um, the Greek Prime Minister said this morning, if it comes back to us, it would be a bad development. Uh, why did he say that? And what would the consequences be if they had to start? Or, I mean, it, am I right in interpreting Schultz as saying we might have to start all over again? When you use a phrase like back to the drawing board, it suggests really starting all over again and losing months on what, as you said, they've been talking about. How do you see this playing out? Well, first of all, it's not the first time that... Um... Uh, Olaf Scholz is expressing himself in a way which can be very much interpreted. Um, so this is something which you also witness at the national level. Um, the thing is, I think the great prime minister is right, because if it goes back to the European Council, where there's now a discussion as to whether there will be uh, an informal, extraordinary European Council potentially in November, it means that you have not reached an agreement uh, among energy ministers, and you lose even more time. Uh, plus, you're also signaling to the markets, look, the U27 agreed in October, the heads of state on XYZ on the corridor, but now they're not able to implement it. So that would be sending the wrong signal. So from this perspective, and um, the signal of urgency, which it's something which we actually are under, um, would be countered by the fact if there is the need for another European Council meeting in November, or even if this drags on to December. Um, but um, my appreciation is that um, I think we're going to see progress. Um, the Commission now has now also a stronger mandate to come up with proposals or to make proposals more concrete. Um, the energy ministers have a mandate. They are under pressure. They need to deliver. Um, but it could be that you will reach a point because all of these elements will have to be part of the bargain. Um, you cannot skip one or the other because this is now what, uh, what where everyone is gaining from one or the other aspect. So they won't be backtracking the, the heads of state from that, uh, which could mean that you would eventually might need another round of consultation at the highest political level in order then to seal the deal um, at, at the ministerial level. Um, that's not to be excluded. That would not be uh, the thing we actually need now, because Feynman is right, um, the winter is approaching, we have all these uncertainties, and you don't, you shouldn't add more uncertainties um, on top of what we already have in terms of uncertainty uh, when it comes to, uh, to, the, to the energy deal among the EU27. Before we move on to other issues, Fabian, was there any wider conversation about the economic situation, about the cost of living crisis, and if there wasn't, should there have been? I think the, the focus was very much on what do we do in the energy field, um, but clearly that is directly linked to the cost of living. And uh, that's why we have also this focus on gas prices and um, in, in a sense energy bills, um, because that's where we're, we're going to see the effect uh, of this or not, as the case may be. Um, but uh, clearly there is also a broader um, environment, uh, an economic downturn, um, which wasn't so much discussed, um, I would say for two reasons. One, I think mostly this is seen as being uh, in the national domain. It's up to member states to come up with measures, and we are seeing some measures being put into place. Uh, but also um, because, frankly, I think uh, people don't know what to do. Mm. Um, because the, the traditional method of counteracting such a downturn, which is essentially debt financed uh, fiscal measures, uh, doesn't work very well uh, in a high inflation uh, downturn. Uh, monetary policy 
uh, doesn't work very well in a high inflation downturn. So I think there's also a lack of good ideas of what you can actually do. Just picking up on that point, and I'll come back to Mario Draghi uh, in a different sense later, but he did, in his last appearance at the EU summit, call again for a common EU fund to tackle the crisis. Uh, is there any sign of that being a runner? Um, I don't see any sign at this moment. Um, I mean, clearly, uh, Draghi's comments were very much uh, picked up, um, but I don't see the political momentum at this moment in time. Um, if I can be a bit normative, uh, there should be, uh, because I think we do need to think about uh, how we actually not only deal with today's crisis, but we should be actually starting to think about what can we do uh, to prepare Europe for um, the world we are going to be living in, uh, including um, the big competitiveness uh, challenge which we are facing, uh, that our economic models are not going to function in the way they did before the crisis. Um, our biggest economy, for example, had a very high dependence um, on relatively cheap energy. Uh, that is not going to be an option uh, for the future. So um, I would say what we particularly need to think about is how do we manage uh, to get those investments which we're going to need in economic security, in technology, uh, in the green transition, um, in all of those areas, we need massive amounts of investment. Uh, and I don't see at the moment um, any uh, willingness to go beyond what is there in the recovery and resilience facility. Indeed. Uh, let us move. Yes, Yanis, you wanted to come in. Yeah, just one addition. I think we're going to get something. I think that at the end of the day, there will be a mechanism to support member states, uh, especially the most vulnerable. The question is what we might get will this suffice and will this be the right thing at the right moment in time um so i would be less um uh, less uh, negative uh, than fabian is i think there could be something along the lines of the sure model uh, which means loans on the base of on the basis of, of common borrowing uh, but if you talk about and there are some numbers which are already out there of 40 50 billion Let's assume that this number would be realistic. And then if you look into what member states individually are giving um, to their populations. So if you look at these numbers and compare it to potentially 50 billion uh, for, um, for, a, for a European Union of 440 million, this is nothing compared to what is happening at the national level. And it thus is also nothing uh, in terms of actually providing support to the most vulnerable. Uh, whether it's citizens or uh, households or, or companies. Um, so I think that could be something. Um, it might also be something which would could be a concession coming from Germany. There is a lot of talk today that the, this, the energy compromise has already uh, was only possible because there have been concessions from Germany. But I think the pressure is increasing on Berlin uh, to come up uh, with, with further compromises. And this could be one. Um, but is it something which actually helps uh, in terms of its dimension that I'm very skeptical or would be very skeptical about? Thank you very much. I um, want to turn to two other issues that were discussed at the summit uh, before we come back uh, to the question of the pressure on Berlin. And that, first of all, Ukraine. And Yanis, if I could stay with you for a moment uh, in terms of what did EU leaders discuss this time? And again, were there any, any concrete decisions? I know we were hearing calls for potential new sanctions on Russia, um, some specific calls, which um, you might elaborate on about special tribunals to prosecute war crimes and so on. And also they were talking about the support for Ukraine, financial support and otherwise, not just now, but in the medium to long term. Did they actually move any further? What was on the table? What was being called for? And were there any decisions? Well, first of all, um, there's obviously, and one can see that, um, a worrisome escalation of the situation in Ukraine. Uh, we're seeing that uh, Moscow, Russia is escalating um, in manifold ways um, and is doing that in reaction to some of the defeats which has witnessed on the ground. Um, so this is a worrisome moment um, in this war. Um, and that is something I think which you could also feel uh, yesterday and today. 
uh, when you also heard uh, heads of state getting moving into the into the meeting or getting out of the meeting um, and you felt you could strongly fear that there is a sincere worry of how the situation is, is is escalating in terms of concrete results um if you look into the council conclusion there is a lot of reiteration of things which we've heard over the past and i'm not saying this i'm not being critical about this because it is necessary you know to condemn um to condemn what russia is doing to condemn the uh, the illegal um, uh, um the illegal annexation um of donetsk lukansk uh, Kherson, uh, also to um, to say and to reiterate that one would never uh, recognize these illegal uh, annexations, and I could list other issues mm -hmm. which we've heard in the past. Which I think, in the at the end of the day, even if you if you uh, um, repeat things, it all it still makes sense to repeat them in order to show your firmness in terms of how you are supporting the position which you've taken. Yes, we also have some new elements in terms of um, condemnation in the strongest possible form of the Russian missile and drone attacks against civilians and civilian objects. That's something which is now linked to the escalation. Also, the uh, condemnation of the military support provided to Russia by Iranian authorities. But on the, on the, on also the money. New on the money, so they yes. talked about, Ursula von der Leyen was talking about 1.5 billion a month in 2025 in terms of support. But I gather a lot of the detail of, of how that will be paid, what it's for, whether some of it needs to be paid back. Did they make any progress on that? No, because, well, it was, uh, if you listen carefully, as you did uh, to Ursula von der Leyen's press conference, she was uh, saying that Zelensky told uh, the heads of state and government of how much their financial needs is, but this is something which will be mo moved on to finance ministers. Um, right. So um, when you look into some of the promises which have been given, and that's also our criticism coming from from Kiev is that the, that it's not being matched by the actual financial um, uh, deeds coming from the EU 27. Um, so there is a discrepancy here. So it was discussed, but no concrete decisions taken. Uh, Fabian, uh, I don't know whether you want to react on that before we move on to China. No, I, I just think um, not that it was discussed in those terms, um, but I think um, in particular, some of the larger EU member states really have to think about very carefully what kind of signal they're giving at the moment uh, in terms of the rather less than adequate support which is being given to, to Ukraine. Um, and I think this is something which uh, is now playing more and more in the background. I know we're going to come back uh, in a minute also around how Germany is seen, um, but this is certainly one of the factors that people are seeing that the rhetoric of support is really not matched uh, in terms of the scale of the support. And that's often um, not even taking into account that money is promised, which then doesn't flow. So even the, the numbers which are there don't actually get delivered. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, and as you say, we will come back on Germany. And just to remind, if you have any questions, particularly at this point about what happened at the summit, please do uh, submit them now, because we're going to move on to that broader political picture uh, in a one, moment. But sorry, just, Yanis, did you want to jump in? Yeah. One, one addition. You mentioned in your questions, I should, I should have referred to it. Um, what we could, see, what we also saw at this summit, as we saw in previous summits, when it comes to the to the to the situation in Ukraine, there are those countries, including especially the Baltic countries and the Polish, who are asking for more, and yeah. they are continuously asking for more. And others are hesitant to go in that direction. Um, you were already mentioning the special tribunal, um, which uh, especially the Baltics are asking for this idea to use frozen assets um, to frozen Russian assets to support Ukraine. That's, we're talking about 300 billion, um, where there are a lot of legal questions. Um, and the question is, how far are the EU 27 ready to go? Mm -hmm. um, but you're seeing that a good number of member states, especially uh, the Baltics, uh, Poland, are very much pushing, uh, knowing that this is not the moment to take these decisions, but they are preparing the political ground to take further decisions in terms of being able to put uh, Moscow uh, under pressure through additional sanctions or through other means um, which they have in mind. 
uh, like, for example, the special tribunal. OK, let's turn our attention to China now. Um, and we heard a lot of words in the run up to the summit and on the day of the summit talking, using words like hostile about China, fierce competitor. The Slovenian prime minister said today uh, that there were very diversified views, and I'm quoting directly, around the table about China, the extent of uh, concern expressed by different countries, to what extent uh, people saw China on a, on a par in some ways with Russia or not at all. Um, but the tone does seem to be hardening, uh, particularly Ursula von der Leyen as well, taking a tough uh, stance on this. Um, Fabian, from your perspective, what concretely did they talk about in relation to China? And what can we read into this, both the diversity of views, but this general hardening of the tone? I think when we look at what they talked about, the first thing uh, we have to say is tone matters. It matters how the overall perception is. It matters what kind of signals are given as well. Um, and I think what we have seen over the last years is a uh, continuing re-evaluation of China um, with the tone getting harder. Um, and now we have the additional um, challenge from Ukraine and uh, the question of where does China stand when it comes uh, to um, the support of you, um, Ukraine, support of Russia. Um, and in some ways, uh, it's uh, turning the, the old saying a little bit on its head. Um, the friend of my enemy uh, might also be considered my enemy. And I think this is something where there's a real acute um, perception, certainly in some countries, uh, that China is not doing enough um, to uh, influence Moscow in the right direction. Um, but there is also, and I think this is something which we have seen over the years, uh, China is not a partner like any other. China is not even a competitor like any other. Uh, we have talked about systemic rival. Um, what I would also add to that, it's a structural economic determinant. Mm -hmm. What happens in China has a huge impact on our economies. And that is why we still have very different views, very different approaches, um, because some countries are structurally dependent on the Chinese economy. Yeah. Uh, and as long as that is the case, there will always be this tension about how do we actually deal uh, in moments of crisis, in moments of friction. Um, and we are seeing that even being played out at the national level um, at the moment. There's a huge discussion in Germany around what happens with Hamburg port and whether China uh, will be taking control, where also different parts of the system are taking very different views, where the coalition partners are taking different views. So I think this is clearly a sign of uh, the importance of China, uh, certainly in the German economy and in some other economies. But, but, but yeah, this, does this diversity of views, I mean, at this stage, uh, how worried should we be that the EU can't agree? Uh, and just linking to, to that point about Germany, and I don't want to call, talk more generally yet about uh, Olaf Scholz, but one thing, he is planning a solo trip to China in November. That has been criticised by other EU leaders saying this should be, these sorts of conversations should be a matter for the 27. Um, do we need to be concerned about the diversity of views? Well, I think, first of all, this is one of the issues where it's probably overdue that we're having a more sincere debate among the EU27. Um, now, if you look back, and Fabian is right, we're seeing a development in um, EU-China relations, which over time has deteriorated. So this goes be beyond the or before uh, the 24th of February. Um, however, the um, Russian aggression against Ukraine, the, the way in which China had positioned itself in the beginning, how it is positioning itself now, and everyone's having a careful eye at how, are they, how they are positioning themselves. And they themselves know that and are also careful. Um, they're not providing uh, military assistance um, uh, to, to Russia. Um, also, the, the financial sector banks are careful in their dealings with Russia. So um, we see that there, the sign coming from the EU27 has reached Beijing in the context of the war in Ukraine. Uh, but anyhow, uh, there are differences of opinion of what the lessons 
of uh, our relationship with Russia and now the war in Ukraine means uh, in terms of our future relationship with China. Um, so there is a need to have this discussion because this is one of the issues, not the only, but one of the issues where you have a fundamental question, where you have difference among the EU27, which have a negative repercussion on today. Uh, so, so this is something where you actually need to have this debate. Um, and there is still a big, if you look at from a meta level, uh, the big question of how we, meaning the EU27, will position ourselves um, in this uh, new world which is appearing in front of our eyes. Uh, will we actually try to be an in-between power, which some still believe we could be between China and the US? Um, or are we going to have to align ourselves uh, with one side more than the other? And what are the consequences of that? Especially if you take the economic uh, considerations which Fabian was highlighting um, into account. So this is a very necessary strategic discussion, which by, is by no means over, uh, but the strategic discussion also needs to need to to lead to concrete decision, and that's not where that are, we're far away from that. Indeed, I want to move on to the political backdrop to this summit in a moment. I want to talk about Germany. I want to talk about the Franco-German relationship, about Italy, and unfortunately, we can't avoid it given the extraordinary develops in the developments in the UK, uh, the EU-UK relationship. But John Palmer, you have a question. I've opened your mic. Fire away. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I want to just ask a question on China. <clears throat> in the financial world, the discussion about China is increasingly moving on to the prospect of a serious weakening in the Chinese economy. Some describe uh, it in quite stark terms that China is facing a structural economic crisis. Uh, uh, one hears a great deal of what the competitive threat of China is. I just wondered whether there was any echo of that in uh, the discussions. And if I may be permitted, Jackie, a second quick question uh, on another subject. Was there any appraisal of the European political community project at the summit as to indicating what direction the union would like to see it go. Thank you very much indeed. John, always good to hear from you. Uh, Fabian, perhaps if you can pick up on the Chinese question and Yanis on the European political community question. Fabian first. I mean, I think um, there's uh, certainly an awareness um, that uh, both economically and politically, things are not going in the direction which China would want it to. Um, the ongoing aftermath, um, which is not an aftermath for China uh, of COVID, with continuous lockdowns, with continuous difficulty in getting it under control, is weighing both politically and economically on China. Um, but there are also some very uh, significant structural issues uh, which China has to deal with including, for example, the property market, where um, a lot of things um, are out of kilter. Um, I don't see that there was a lot of discussion of this. Um, I think the focus was much more on the political level. Um, but the reality is that if we do get um, severe problems in China, uh, then that's not a solution, rather the opposite, um, because of that structural dependence we have. Uh, on China, uh, any problems in China will further add to the economic downturn, will further add to inflation problems in Europe. Uh, so ultimately, um, while that is a realistic possibility, um, uh, it's actually a very worrying thing from a European perspective. Thank you. And Yanis, any discussion, any language on the European political community after the meeting two weeks ago? No, and uh, that should not come as a surprise because um, there are still so many question marks with respect to the potentials of Epoch of what it should become or it should not become. Um, so um, I was not surprised that this was not taken up. Um, at some point it will return, but this was not the moment to discuss uh, what uh, the European political community might develop into and what its relationship is, um, for example, on issues related to the future security okay. architecture, um, but also with respect to enlargement, which there's um, one is trying to uh, delink um, the political community from that. But uh, politically, we know that there is a discussion as to whether it will be linked at the end of the day with each other. Mm -hmm. Let us come uh, to something we've alluded to a number of times, and first specifically on the question of Germany, because people are beginning 
to talk about what they call the German problem. Uh, they point to the fact that Germany, potentially the biggest obstacle to finding a deal on the energy issues we talked about earlier, uh, hesitant on another common EU fund, the Draghi proposal, lost the argument over the mid-cap pipeline uh, and uh, where France was opposed um, to this line from uh, the Iberian Peninsula to Northern Europe, the row over the 200 billion euro energy package in Germany, which was seen as a threat to the, the single market. Um, Emmanuel Macron said, and I quote, it is not good for Europe and for Germany that it isolates itself. Is Germany isolating itself? And if it is, what could the potential consequences be for the EU that has always relied on Germany to play this leadership role? You know, far from being the one that blocks progress, it's always been the country that's helped to find solutions. Uh, how do you both read this situation and, and Germany at the moment? Who would like to come in first? Yanis and then Fabian, yeah? I can start, whatever. Um, well. First of all, yes, there is a, a, an issue with respect to Berlin. Um, and you can call it a, a German problem, which is now the word which is being used. Um, and it is uh, the result, I think, of multiple factors. And a lot is, um, is uh, at the fault of Berlin, of the, of the coalition government in Berlin itself, um, in terms of bad communication, bad decisions, uh, unconsciousness uh, for how these things are being viewed uh, outside Germany. Um, we have a coalition government uh, with the three parties part of it, um, which is struggling. Um, they are struggling because uh, some of the parties are profiting more from this coalition than others, especially if you compare the Greens and the FTP. Um, now you had the elections in Niedersachsen, which uh, the FTP didn't even make it into the parliament uh, in, in, in Niedersachsen. Um, so you have a struggling coalition where everyone is trying to profile him herself in this coalition. You have major dis differences among the three parties. So you're very much uh, occupied with yourself. Um, yeah. And when you then have the doppelbombs, as Scholz called it, the, the 200 billion plus the 1995 billion, which already has been put um, into the pot of the emergency measures uh, with respect to the energy crisis, um, you have no reflection about what to, how this is being perceived or no strong reflection. I'm sure that um, one or the other was hinting towards the fact that this might have also consequences uh, at the European level, might have lead to reactions at the European level, but the concerns are mostly related to the to the German level. Um, this is not nationalism, but it's a strong national orientation. It's a um, me first attitude, which you can see in Germany. Um, and that is being viewed very negatively from the outside for very good reasons. Um, so you now get to a moment like the one which we experienced uh, over the past weeks and also now uh, in view of this uh, summit, where you openly have um, a contestation of what is coming out of Berlin, whether you know the rhetoric of solidarity is actually only rhetoric and nothing which is uh, which is very concrete. Then you have the fact that uh, that the meeting uh, between the German and the French uh, government uh, okay. was postponed, um, which shows you that the frictions um, are deep. They, they you can recover from them. Um, but there are deep uh, frictions, and these frictions have a lot to do with how the German government had positioned itself, also on key questions. If you look back into, you know, weapons delivery, which was a huge issue in Germany, but also at the European level in terms of how the Schultz government is, is, is dealing with this issue. Okay. And I could give you numerous other examples. Yeah. Um, and that's bad news. And it's bad news from a European perspective, because we know that you need German leadership, whether you like it or not. Um, and it's also bad news from a German perspective. Okay. Okay, uh, Fabian, for you, how serious a German problem, if you like, do we have? And, and Yanis referred there to the postponement of a meeting, a Franco-German meeting, supposed to be a government-to-government -government ministerial meeting next week. Uh, you also talked, Yanis, about bad communications. One of the suggestions as to why that meeting has been postponed to January was that German ministers wanted to spend half term with their children, <laughs> uh, which seemed frankly uh, absurd um, and has caused quite a lot of anger. I mean. Two, two questions. How serious do you think this German problem is uh, and, the, and the deterioration in the Franco-German relationship? I quoted Emmanuel Macron earlier. Uh, things are not good. The traditional engine is not firing. How much does it matter? I think it's very difficult not to be uh, rather pessimistic um, because it does matter. 
uh, it matters a lot. Uh, it has always mattered. Um, Franco-German cooperation has never been um, a sufficient condition to make progress, but it is a necessary condition. Um, so if we are not getting that kind of agreement, uh, we are not going to be advancing on any um, of the significant structural questions we are facing. Um, but, and this is not meant in any way as an excuse for uh, what is happening in Germany, but I think the problem is we're actually facing a leadership problem. It's mm. not just Germany. It is across the board that we are missing the um, strategic thinking, that we're missing the coming together, saying we have common objectives, which are very important at this moment in time. We need to agree on what we are trying to achieve, and then we need to put in place whatever is necessary to achieve those. Rather, what we're seeing in all countries, um, and the German one is maybe a particularly pronounced version of that, um, but what we are seeing in all countries is my country first, because I worry about what my electorate is thinking. I worry about uh, whether I can sell any of this at home. I worry about what will happen when people um, start to feel some of the real impact of uh, the uh, Russian aggression uh, against mm -hmm. Ukraine. So what we actually need um, is that our leaders in all countries take their responsibility seriously, uh, stop thinking about whether they're going to be re-elected or not, um, but actually recognize that they have the responsibility of European leadership in a war. And if they are not going to fulfill that, we are all going to pay the price for that. Mm. Thank you very much. Janis, a comment to this and to the Franco-German relationship? Well, I think that there is a strong awareness in those quarters in Berlin, which deal with European affairs and the care about the EU in terms also of Germany's positioning within it. Um, and that is something which also before the summer break, you had and you could feel um, that there's a sense among those forces of something's going wrong. Um, and now when you see these things happen over the past weeks, um, it makes it even worse because that means that there is pressure on behalf of those parts in, in, in Berlin who have a strong European orientation um, on the government, who are also trying to move things in the wrong direction, and then they don't move in the, uh, sorry, to move in the right direction, obviously, and then they don't move in the right direction, but uh, on the contrary. That, I think, is something which is uh, very worrisome. Um, and if you can make a comparison, one always needs to be careful when doing these comparisons. But if you compare it to where we were in 2020, uh, when there was also criticism vis-a-vis -vis Germany, and it was also, by the way, related to um, to the to the to potential fragmentation of the single market, um, there was a German government led by then Chancellor Merkel um, who decided that the important thing was to find a compromise with with France and that led to the compromise of May 2020 which eventually led to next generation EU um, so we're so far away from that now we have a German government which is 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 acting contrary to what I was advocating uh, they're very much in a defensive um, they're defending themselves. They say at the end of the day, it's not more than others are spending. It's always defending themselves. Then they have to give up on certain issues like they had to give up with respect to the price cap uh, yesterday. Um, but they never come out of this defensive European uh, stance and coming up with constructive proposals of how to deal with these problems, which would be very much in their interest, as it was in May 2020 to, run, to find the agreement with, um, with, um, uh, with France, which, yes, it did cost Germany some money, but compared to what was at stake from a German perspective also, it was very limited. But that feeling, this sentiment, this thinking is does not exist at this present point in, in, in Berlin. Some are pushing in this direction, but they're seeing hesitance from the government. And that is something which, and I fully agree with Fabian, is extremely worrisome. Mm. Uh, Fabian, just coming on to another EU leader um, who is departing the scene, uh, and we're talking there about a lack of leadership and some saying never did we need a Merkel uh, round the EU table more. Uh, we now lose, as of today, Mario Draghi round the EU table. He was given um, a, a very grand farewell. Uh, there were reminders of that time when he was ECB president in the Eurozone crisis when he said he would do whatever it takes, uh, which is widely credited with helping to save the euro, how much will he be missed? And particularly at a time like this, when we have these difficulties between 
France and Germany, when that lack of leadership that you're both talking about is so evident? I think uh, it adds to the overall um, lack of leadership we have. Um, I think he, um, not only because he was leading Italy, um, but also because he had actually gained a lot of credibility um, also at the European level, um, not being necessarily seen as uh, uh, one of the irresponsible um, fiscal southerners, but um, actually having a role within the euro crisis, which very much um, saved the euro, um, of course, in combination with what others were doing. Uh, so to lose him at this moment in time, um, also, we shouldn't forget what he's being replaced by, um, I think is a major issue. Um, and it just adds to the overall sense that we really don't have anyone at the European level at the moment who is steering us into any direction. Um, it's very much reactive, very much um, just trying to uh, survive today, not thinking about what are the kind of strategic choices we can make today, so that tomorrow we're not going to be in an even worse position. Um, I, might, I might ask you at the end of the end of this uh, update what you would say to EU leaders to convince them to begin showing that leadership. So you might want to think about that for a moment. But um, Fabian made a reference there, Yanis, to what Mario Draghi is being replaced with. Um, and what do we make of developments? And today, uh, Meloni was given the mandate to form a government, but there are signs of the coalition, coalition fracturing even before she has done so, particularly in relation to Silvio Berlusconi and linking this back to the Russia discussion, his comments this week about his friend, Vladimir Putin, he said one of his first five true friends, they've apparently been exchanging vodka and letters and so on. And Maloney though, perhaps surprising everybody by saying this will be a pro-European and pro-NATO government. And she said, Italy with us in government will never be the weak link in the West. So is that reassuring, do you think? Um, what do you make of, of developments in Italy and what we can expect? Well, first of all, when you have these kind of coalition between these kind of partners, this is not the first case where you see how difficult it is for them to cooperate with each other. Um, when they are on the extreme or radical, or even worse, uh, right of the political extreme, um, for them to cooperate um, is a difficult endeavor because they have a certain way of doing politics. Um, uh, and that's where populists, if they get into power, need to prove themselves that they can do the switch yeah. of uh, being anti against everything, uh, the establishment and whatever you, you, might, have, you might think of, um, into something which is constructive. Um, so I, I'm not really surprised that they're having problems. And let's not forget, now we're talking about Berlusconi Meloni, but uh, we also had Salvini Meloni um, having an infight. And so um, that this will be and would be a complicated coalition, I think, is no surprise. And the positive um, tone from Meloni on Europe and on NATO? Is, is no surprise, because, and that's interesting, huh? um, because um, even before the election, when you were having discussions with uh, people who know Italy better than I do, and they were telling you that uh, Meloni, Fratelli d'Italia, um, in, a, in a way, have been preparing themselves and, and smartly preparing themselves for potentially winning these elections and not leading themselves and maneuvering themselves in a position where they will be criticized about certain fundamentals like EU or NATO. Um, so they've taken a clear stance on saying we're not challenging Italy's, uh, Italy being member of the EU or NATO. We might have different appreciations of how things should be working at the EU level, but we're not fundamentally challenging it. Um, and that is a stance which they had pre prepared and we knew that they would take once they get to, uh, to the point where they now are, meaning to form a coalition government. The question is, how strong will this coalition government be? Plus, if they form the coalition and if they are wisely dealing with some fundamental questions, how they will be using this at the national level. Uh, will this give them then the room and maneuver to be pushing Italy in a certain political direction, um, fulfilling some of the dreams of some of these right wing uh, populists are having in mind? That's a big question mark. Huh? Um, but uh, I, I think I'm not surprised either by the position of Meloni, nor by the fact that they're having problems in this coalition government. I think it will continue to have problems. Let's talk about problems in government in another country.
And she says that, as you can hear my voice sinking, uh, you'll guess from my accent why my voice is sinking. 45 days, Prime Minister, Liz Truss is gone. We have another Tory leadership election. We have talk of the return of Boris Johnson. Um, Fabian, I, I'm trying to keep <laughs> emotion. I'm supposed to be the neutral moderator here, trying to keep emotion out of my voice. What is the EU making of what's happening in the UK? And what does it mean now? do you think for EU-UK relations? And I just wanted to ask you, because two weeks ago, we had Liz Truss, she was at the European Political Community meeting. There was a warmer atmosphere, a feeling that negotiations on EU-UK were taking a more positive tone, that maybe we were on the verge of something new. Now this turmoil in British politics throws all that into doubt. And you tweeted yesterday, and I was intrigued, so I want to know why you said this. I'm gonna quote it in full. I didn't think I would write this so shortly after Brexit, you wrote, but it is time now for the EU to set out clearly under what circumstances and with what conditions the UK could rejoin the EU. Are you suggesting that the result of all this turmoil could indeed be the UK coming back into the Union, or were you hinting at something else? Um, let, let me actually start with a, a little link to what we just talked about. Um, I think one of the things which we are seeing uh, in uh, all of the parties around Europe uh, is that the Eurosceptic tendencies, which used to be there, mm -hmm. have been torn down. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that is that however bad it gets within the EU, it doesn't get as bad as what we're seeing over in the UK. Um, and I think it is an extraordinary spectacle. Um, I certainly have never observed anything like that. Uh, allow me a little cultural reference um, for those of us who've seen the thick of it. Uh, this is uh, the thick of it, but without Malcolm Tucker controlling. Um, so it is completely. For those who don't chaos. know what it is, it was a parody of British politics uh, and some of the, um, how, how can I put this, more colourful aspects of British yeah. politics, but a parody it was intended to be, but a parody it is no more. But sorry Indeed. to interrupt, Fabian. No, no, the... but that's, I, I think what we are seeing, um, and it is literally uh, that you, when you follow the debate, when you look on Twitter, you're reading comments which sound like parody all of the time. Um, you're hearing language which wouldn't be used in um, a normal political debate. So in many ways, uh, the British political system is disintegrating. Uh, and the question is now how quickly that's going to take place. Um, this trust uh, was there uh, for a month and a half. Uh, we had a week ago, we had a different chancellor. Um, this is now a system which um, where the volatility is extremely high. Um, so it might even end up, as you mentioned, with Boris Johnson being back in number 10. Um, if that is the case, um, I think what we are going to see uh, is a rather quick disintegration of uh, the government. Um, because there are a number of uh, Conservative MPs who would no longer uh, support that and uh, also who would be uh, vindictively ousted by Boris Johnson given their role in his downfall um, or his temporary downfall. But even if it is a different PM, um, this is a political system which is completely disintegrated. Um, what does that mean for EU-UK relations? Um, I think in the short term, it uh, means a high degree of volatility. Whoever is going to be there, we cannot make any kind of agreement with them. Um, there is no political backing for anything which comes out of this. There will be no policy made in the UK for the foreseeable future. Um, because there is no political system to push through any policies. So your tweet about rejoining, what was that about? So, the, the tweet about rejoining, I want to be very clear. I didn't make any kind of comment on the desirability of that happening. I didn't make a comment on how quickly it could happen or on what kind of conditions. I think what was important from my perspective is that there is now a debate in the UK, driven also by 60% of people saying in opinion polls that Brexit was a mistake. Uh, so there's a debate now, what will happen once the Labour Party gets into power, because now 
uh, it seems to be only a question of time before that happens. And what would be the Labour Party stance towards the European Union and towards in particular rejoining? Um, and what I wanted to um, push here is that when we have that debate, we have to make sure that that debate is grounded in realism. And we have to decide on the EU side, what is it we actually want? Mm. Do, would we want to have a UK back, uh, given what has been happening, uh, given also um, what kind of conditions could we impose on the UK? How would we get a commitment to the European Union? How would we be able to have some form of constitutional lock-in? Um, so for me, this is a, about a debate which needs to happen at the EU side so that we are clear what we want and then we can give that message to the British system. And a number of people have said, oh, it's not a good idea. Uh, it will have a negative impact on the British system. Frankly, I no longer care what impact we are having on the British system. I think this is about us deciding now what is the right thing for the European Union to do um, and how should we react to the developments, these extraordinary developments we're seeing over in the UK. Janis, a word to our pain. Um, it's difficult to add a word to your pain. Um, but um, yes, Fabian is right. Uh, from the EU 27 perspective, you need to make up your mind of what you want. Um, but as one is observing it from the outside, um, where parody is a word that comes to mind, but tragedy is the other word that comes to mind. Um, and if you see these um, deep political prog problems, uh, Fabian called it a disintegration of the political system, um, you wonder as to whether this is a partner which potentially in future, even in the long term future, you would want to have on board. Mm -hmm. um, and you could even argue if you see all the mess which Brexit has caused, um, it's only 60 percent who think that uh, Brexit was a mistake. Actually, it should be made much more if you see from the outside of what this has leading to has led to in terms of the political system in the country and um, is leading to in terms of the integrity of, of the country leading to in terms of the economy of the country. Um, so uh, from the outside, I think uh, money and the EU 27 think are bewildered when you look at when they look to the UK. And the last thing they have in mind is that they would want to have uh, the UK back on board. Um, and I think that a lot of um, glass is broken here. Mm, thank you very much. It is striking. You say only 60% think it was a mistake. But if you look at the figures who say, when you ask them, is it going well? The figures are even higher. There's something like 75% say, no, it's not going well at all. It's whether they want to reverse it, if you like, uh, then the, the numbers narrow. We are almost out of time, but I wanted to um, put a challenge to you. And it came, comes from something uh, Fabian said earlier when he was talking about that leadership problem. And you said we have to, you know, we have they have to start leading. And you said they have to stop worrying about whether they're going to win the next election. Well, isn't that a little bit like asking turkeys to vote for Christmas? Uh, what would you say right Right now, each of you, and I'll start this time with Yanis, to convince EU leaders that now they really, in the situation we are facing, they really do have to step up to the plate and provide that leadership that you both said is so lacking at this moment. Uh, in one minute, your elevator pitch to EU leaders to convince them that they really have no choice but to do this. Yanis. They have no choice because what happened um, on the 24th of February is a Zeitenwende, is a watershed. And we're still asking ourselves uh, of what it means, and we're not fully aware of what it means. Um, we are being told uh, we now need to concentrate on the immediate concerns. We now need to deal with the energy crisis, uh, with the cost of living crisis. These are the things we need to deal with. We don't have time now to discuss all the other issues which um, I and others are, are signaling as being potential consequences of the 24th of February, including our relationship with China, including our relationship with the US, including the question of how we actually will be dealing with enlargement, how we will be reforming the European Union. I could go on. These are fundamental questions. Um, and when you raise that, um, people like I are being told, me are being told, uh, this is not the time to do so. And I think this is the wrong approach. If you now want to show leadership, you actually need to be ahead of the curve and think of what happens if you again will be uh, facing a 24th of February 
and not having prepared for it. And it might be a 24th of February, which in economic terms, look at China, uh, we might be uh, okay. much more under pressure. And in security terms, we might find ourselves as EU, as member states under pressure, as now other countries uh, have found themselves in a very difficult situation. Um, this is something we need to avoid. And I think leadership should be about that, even though I know how politics work. Tiny bit over one minute, but I'll let you flow because uh, uh, your passions uh, were clearly running high there. Fabian, what would you say to EU leaders right at this moment? You need to stop talking about Zeitenwende and watershed and actually live it uh, because the world has changed fundamentally and we're facing two major problems. One is that unless we take the right actions now, in the future, we will not be able to determine our interests, to protect our values. Um, and we only have this one chance to do it. And the second problem is unless we find ways of sitting in the same boat, really doing it, it will tear the union apart. Because when people are cold and hungry in one country, but not in another, when people feel directly threatened militarily in one country, but not another, then this is going to be the end of the union. And in the end, political leaders should look at what is their responsibility. Look in your constitution, look what it says about what your role is. It doesn't say there your role is to be re-elected. It is there to lead the country, do what is right. And it's now time that they do what is right. Gentlemen, thank you both for your analysis analysis and for your passion. Uh, it's been a great discussion. Thank you to all of you for joining us. That is all we have time for. Just to point out that there will be a paper coming from the EPC next week on how to increase the impact of EU sanctions against Russia, one of the topics we touched on this afternoon. Uh, and we will be back uh, with our next update uh, next month. In the meantime, it only remains for me to wish you a very pleasant weekend. Take care and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.